Hi everyone, this is YMP TV. And for those who've been following us since the beginning, you know that we've been interviewing a series of mining executives or stakeholders in the mining sector just to hear their thoughts on what is happening during COVID or I guess like in a sense a bit of post-COVID or um, any reper repercussions or their thoughts on what is coming up next, what needs to be changed. And today we have Gordon Neal, president of New Pacific Metal. Hi, Gordon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, it's uh, exciting to to be part of this because I've I've watched what you been watching what you have been doing, and I think it's important. Thank you. So I guess like we'll we'll dive in right away in the topic of the hour. <laughs> so just just a bit of background first on on the company and. We know that you have a project in Bolivia. So just if you can tell us if COVID-19 has any impact on the project. Yeah, so let me just go, uh, just give you a rundown of how we got to where we were in Bolivia. Rui Fang is uh, the CEO of Silver Corp and he was the past CEO of New Pacific. He just moved aside for Mark uh, Cruz to come in. And uh, Rui is a, a consummate um, mining executive who runs uh, Silver Corp. He's been running it for 14 years. He is basic, he's a PhD in geology, but he's an entrepreneur. So his focus is to make sure that, that businesses that he runs are profitable. And it's very difficult to get profitable mining um, operations. They're difficult to make profitable given the vagaries of, uh, of commodity prices. But in the last 14 years, he's probably been profitable, I'd say 12 of the last 14 years. He's He's created, uh, he's produced um, 80 million ounces of silver. Uh, he pays a dividend. So his focus is profitable mining ventures. Uh, he went to he he went to Bolivia um, in 2016 in December and saw three drill holes that he liked. Um, coming back after that, he he wrote a check from Silver Corp for 20 million dollars for the company for New Pacific. Uh, Pan American Silver came in and wrote a check for $27 million after that. But primarily, it's important to understand that it wasn't, he's a PhD in geology, but it wasn't just the geology that he liked about the project. He spent six weeks in Bolivia, and he liked what he saw from a community standpoint and from a cultural standpoint. So knowing that Bolivia had been mining since the 1500s, that it drives a, a large part of their economy, what well, is part of the mindset you have to have to go into these countries to, to look for these kinds of assets um, uh, in the first place, right? So he, that, that, that's just the basis of how we got going was, was not only the geology, but also the, the culture and the people in the environment. Uh, we fast-tracked uh, the, the, our drill program. We had the largest drill program in South America between 2017 and 2019. 100,000 meters each uh, each year, so it was about, uh, sorry, it's 100,000 meters of drilling. Uh, and out of that came uh, what he was looking for, which is a, a tier one large-scale asset. These are the ones you have to look for if you really want to look for good economics in a, in a project. So we found our, our resource just came out recently. It's 155 million ounces of silver, and it's pure silver. It's a silver-only deposit. Um, at 137 grams per ton in the measured and indicated category, which is important because we're a new company and to have drilled it to that confidence and de-risk level of M&I on the first go is, is, um, is a little unusual for, but that's again speaks to the management and the type of, um, the type of people that we are. We want to give them, you have to give the market confidence and we have to have confidence. Um, we have, that's 155 million ounces at 135, that's on the M&I, and on the inferred side, we have 35 million uh, ounces of silver at 112 uh, grams per ton. Now, this mineralization sticks out of the ground at surface, and it's important to know, from a young mining professional, I'm sure you guys are aware, that surface, um, mineralization at surface is hard to find. Um, it's really been exploited all around the world, unless you go into developing countries like like Bolivia or somewhere in in, the, in Eastern Europe or um, uh, in in Africa. Some of these underdeveloped. So that that's important to know about who we are um, as a company. 
Um, on the COVID side, how it affected us was basically the same as everybody else. Uh, in March, uh, we shut down. Or we shut down in March. Um, we 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 took our geologists who we have 50, 50 employees in Bolivia. Um, they all went to their homes because they were trying to protect themselves and everybody was staying and shuttering in place. But we used that opportunity to review our database, our models, um, to do desktop work uh, as geologists and as as mining engineers. So. Um, it was, it, that was an important time for us to review everything, check our samples, check our, our data, and it's been very helpful for us. Um, now, Bolivia, because Bolivia is a, is a country where mining is so essential, it makes up, I think, 26% of their, uh, their exports and about 9% of their GDP. Um, they shut down as well. Bolivia shut down as well. So they opened it up. Uh, but being that mining is essential, they opened up mining almost first. And so we're planning on going back to work uh, at the end of this month. Okay. Yeah. And staying in Bolivia, um, has the res resignation of, of President Morales caused any impact on the mining side? Yeah, so it was a failed election. Um, uh, he, he resigned and ran away because of uh, um, discrepancies in, in the vote count. But it really hasn't affected us. Um, his 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 resignation really hasn't affected us. Currently, uh, Janine Añez is the interim president of the country, uh, but she, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, very early on they shut the country down. Um, but they had to they had to when they opened it up. Mining was one of the first um, areas to open up. They were banging uh, banging on the gates to get mining opened up. Now they've opened it up in a safe way. They've got good protocols in place. Um, but uh, yes, it's, op it's opening up now, but it hasn't really affected mining because the interim president has, has opened up the, uh, has opened it up again. Okay, and have you noticed any impact on exploration financing since, since COVID hit, basically? Well, um, exploration financing has just gone off the charts. Uh, I, it did get affected. Um, during during the initial stages of COVID, but um, I think if because of the world economy, the way it went off the edge of a cliff, because there are um, treasuries around the world have had to pay for COVID, uh, and the value of the dollar has uh, the value of the dollar to treasuries have dropped so significantly. I think the market is looking at gold and saying, "Look, uh, you know, as a hedge against this." against this drop in valuation, we need to have some gold. So, you know, um, at uh, $19, at $1,800 gold, that's been holding for quite a while, we just hit $19 silver, uh, first time in nine years. Uh, I'm not sure that'll hold it. In fact, I'll say something different. I believe that we will hit $20 silver before the end of the year. I'm not sure about gold. However, you know, these are the, the the mining finance and exploration finance, just S&P numbers have shown me, and S&P numbers right now show that since January of this year, 550 mining companies, junior mining companies have done finances for $3.6 billion in capital. It's big. So this is one of the biggest drivers I've seen since I sort of walked in the door in 2003 and started with Mag Silver. And now I want to ask you about another topic that has been all over the news. Um, so we've seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. How do you think it translates, like this issue translates in the mining sector? And if you think there's any issue, what do you think com like mining companies could or should do? I guess like yeah, it's well, also like diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing that up because as a black executive myself, I mean, I'm getting a lot of questions from a lot of non-black and white executives about what, what books they should read. It, I mean, it just, this whole George Floyd thing just took everybody by surprise. Uh, I shouldn't say everybody, but uh, it was such a toxic thing to watch that the reaction to it was, was swift and it's very, very vocal and it's very loud. Uh, the black communities around the world that I'm talking to, particularly in the United States, are actually for the first time seeing, seeing some positive, not just 
sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of talking about it, not just talk about it. They're actually asking for some concrete changes. Um, my own personal experience is a little different in that my background is I came from a family that is a black family, but I, I have an entrepreneurial background. So I had to work uh, making my own money most of my life. I was, I have a few firsts in my life. I was the first black student union president of a university at Dalhousie University, uh, the second largest hire firm in Canada. So I have encountered racism, but not to the level that some others may have. So I'm fortunate in that respect, but that doesn't mean that I'm not cognizant and not, uh, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I feel for the, my black community. But to answer your question about whether, uh, oh yeah, the other part that I should probably add is in my family, there is uh, some inclusiveness on the black and the female side and that my mother's sister is on the $10 bill uh, in, uh, in Canada, Viola Desmond is my aunt. And uh, she was thrown in jail for uh, sitting in a whites only section of a, of a movie theater in Nova Scotia. She fought back, was thrown in jail, got a criminal record, uh, fought against it, but it, it was my mother who went out and got her this notoriety 70 years later uh, that culminated in, in her being on the $10 bill. So she was a woman, an entrepreneur, and maybe that's in my DNA as well. She ran a, a black, a, a series of black beauty salons and was a very successful woman in the, in the black woman in the 40s. In fact, she owned her own car in the 19, 1942, which is unheard of for a black, black woman, yet let alone a black man or a black woman. But um, so that it's, it's in my history and DNA to, to, to uh, work in the, in the entrepreneurial world. But I will say something about the mining sector and, and, and racism and inclusion. I find that the, the way mining is set up, it's, it's, not, um, it's not conducive to exclusion. And that's because if you think of other businesses like car plants or, or food industries, you have supply chains and distribution and you can set your business up wherever it makes the most economic sense to distribute and build and make, and make your product. In mining, you can see behind me here, that, that um, silver mount, mountain of silver is in Bolivia in the Altiplano at 4,000 meters. That's where I have to work. So, and the people that live there, I have to work with these people. So we have to go in, the mining business it has it sort of built in that it has to go in and, and not be judgmental and not be exclusatory, exclusive, ex exclusatory. It has to include the people that live there. It has to train those people. It needs that workforce. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm in a business where, you know, there are some exceptions here I could talk about. In South Africa, it's a big mining country. They should, and they have um, what's called black empowerment programs. So yes, you wanna, yes, you, you, by law, you have to have partnerships with black uh, companies that have black employees, um, but that's mandated. Uh, they don't seem to let the black uh, individual move to the top of the, of the executive ladder too far there. Um, they let uh, the uh, the empowerment programs take care of that. So maybe that we could do more in in that area, but by and large, because we because we need to work with the people where the minerals are, we have to include them and their environment and their their animals and everything. So we do have a little bit of a leg up in our industry in 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 being inclusive. That's interesting. And I guess like an, another, as I should say, like issue in the mining sector that we're currently seeing, and I guess we've been seeing it for, for a little while now, but it's the generational gap. The fact that in the workforce, there's this gap uh, between like in the age group and having the younger generation coming in. So how do you think the mining industry should or what it should be doing to attract like younger generation? Yeah, so let's go through the rationale for why that gap exists in the first place. There are three events uh, that cause that the, the knowledge gap is a, or the generational and the, and the knowledge gap uh, in mining. Uh, one was in the early 80s to the late 80s when copper 
uh, the copper prices fell down and um, uh, the commodity price caused a collapse in the mining business. The second one was the Briex uh, scandal uh, in Indonesia, 19, 1997 to 2003, 2004, which gave rise and gave birth to 43101 um, legislation and guidelines. Uh, and the, the last one was after the banking crisis in 2008, 2009. We had a good commodity run, I think, again, because of the, um, uh, the lack of value or the, or the softness in the, in the, in the financial sector uh, and gold having its, its hedging abilities allowed it to run to at least 2012 when we saw another pullback in commodities uh, from 2012 to 2016, February 2016. Uh, so those three three uh, breaks caused um, basically universities to pull those programs from their curriculums, um, you know, on the mining side and on the ge on, on the geology side, um, because a lot of students weren't well, people weren't asking for them because there was no work in the business. And in those periods when you have those gaps, you will lose some of the um, some of the people who have been working in those, some of the people who get on an age and, and get up there and, they, and they, they wanna retire or they can't find a job themselves and they decide that they're gonna walk away from the business. So you lose um, the education of the younger generation in those gaps and you lose some of the knowledge base that stops working. So those are what those gaps, how those gaps work, how they, how they came about. What we should do about it? Well, we should be, one of the things we should do is make sure that the universities uh, during those downturns at least keep some of those programs going, keep them alive. Um, and the other part, the other way we can do it is to set up mentorship programs. So mentorship programs should be set up so that I'm 65 years old, Peter McGaugh, who's, a, I, I consider him my mentor, mentor, but he's my age. I learned a lot about geology and about uh, mining from Peter McGaugh and Dan McGinnis and at Mag Silver. And so, and I learned a lot from Ray Fang. I'm still learning. I mean, I'm 65, but I'm still learning. I'm one of those guys that'll learn until I'm, until I'm turning over. But, but we need to we need to have mentorship programs so that so that uh, we this knowledge can be passed on. Um, that's that that is an it's an important part of it. And I think that's one of the ways we can we can do that is to make sure the University of British Columbia uh, has got one of the best. Um, um, geological programs and mining engineering programs in the world. And they are turning out on a constant basis, some great young professionals. Um, the, the sad thing is that when you lose uh, some of the knowledge base from, from, the, uh, from the equation, mistakes that, that were made in the past that could be passed on and avoided to people coming in get lost. And that, that, costs, that costs the industry time and money. I guess staying on the um, the topic of the younger generation, um, so we know that for millennials, environment and social responsibility, the so-called ESGs, are very important. So not only is it important to talk about the ESG to attract those talents, but I guess also to attract young investors and, and shareholders. So what are your thoughts on, I guess, ESG and do you see a shift in the sector towards more responsible mining? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, 15 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, 15 years ago, I met a guy named Don Cox. At, uh, he's an economist at a BMO conference in Florida. And he looked, he, we were talking about mining and where it was going. And he just turned to me. I said, where do you think this is all going? And we were in a bubble at that time. Like it, every commodity was rising. The BRICS guys were, the BRIC was, was buying commodities. China was going, was just exploding. And he said, yeah, this looks great, but I can tell you something. ESG is the word you need to know. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this now. If you don't have your head around going into, he said, as we exploit more and more minerals in the, in the developed world, and I think I said this earlier, we're going to get into a place where we need to go to underdeveloped places to get our commodities. And when you go in there, if you think it's, if you think it's like it was 25 years ago, you could just go in and do anything you wanted, if you're wrong. The, 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 the technology age of the internet and information and, and, uh, and the fact that people can connect with each other um, means that you need to go in there and you need to have all your ducks in a row. The first thing you should be looking at is the community. 
uh, and, this, uh, and the environment before you even start thinking about, you know, turning a drill bit. He says, can you sustain yourself here? So that was 15 years ago, and, it's, he, and his words ring true today. And I think I earlier talked about uh, Ray Fang not only understanding that the geology was the, was the right fit, but it was, um, but the the people there were willing, and they were they were uh, already educated in mining, and the culture was a culture of peace and and um, harmony, uh, and and one with nature. So you got to pay attention to the environment, but you have to pay attention to the, and you have to govern yourself properly. So uh, on on and on the, in the same vein, I'm finding uh, that we're finding, and this happened just the other day, is. One of our, our, one of our, I think our third largest or fourth largest shareholder is Marin Asset Management out of London. We went into a meeting there uh, probably a year ago because we haven't been traveling in a while. But we went there a year ago, and uh, usually I sit down with the uh, the analyst and the portfolio manager. This time there was another person at the table. I'm sorry, I can't remember. It was Robin. Was her name? And she was an ESG, um, ESG professional. So she had a whole bunch of boxes and questions to tick off. And if we, did not, um, if we didn't measure up on the environmental side, you know, they, she just, you know, her report to, to the governance committee is, no, nope, they're not doing anything. We don't like what they're doing and they're not, they're not focused on it. So let's pull the investment, like the investment. And we had a call a week ago with another London firm and they've set up an environmental fund for mining. But you, to get in, to get any capital from it, you have to check off a whole bunch of environmental tick boxes and, and social responsibility, respons responsibility tick boxes. So <clears throat> more and more, the investment community is saying, you know, we don't want to hear about, we don't want to have a problem down the road. I mean, I'll use Escobar as, as, a, as an example. Pan American bought it from Tahoe. Um, but the, and it's an unbelievable asset, but the thing that killed it was, was bad ESG, right? So it's, a, it's extremely important. And I know that, uh, the younger generation and the young mining professionals are focused on that. They know that they know we need these metals, but we need to do it the right way. Absolutely. I fully agree. And Gordon, what advice would you give to a young professional starting its career? whether it's in this period of, of, I guess, like COVID or post-COVID, but, but just also in, in this world that's shifting. Yeah, well, I think that the young mining professional and young people in general have their heads screwed on straight, spend a bit too much time staring at the screen and, and social media. Um, and I, I, I'm a little social media thing myself, but not as my, my daughter is on her phone all the time. However, from that, my daughter looks up to me at 13 years old and can give me information about what's going on instantly from the George Floyd situation to the Donald Trump situation to the, to the um, uh, Trudeau situation in an instant. So, uh, and, and, is, and is very opinionated on it. So the fact that, that the young professionals are, are focused on making, uh, making our life and our, our planet better, I think that that's, it's a good thing. You know, that's, that's the direction they should stay in. They should focus on that. They should also, uh, young mining professionals, as I said earlier, should also try to find somebody um, like myself or Peter McGaw or, or I saw you had Ross Beattie or, or, or um, uh, what's his name, um, Rick Rule. Any of those guys that you've had on and people that, that have, have, have a knowledge base and, and, and actually mentor with these people. And I'm, what I mean about that is sit down and listen to the stories. Ask them where they started. Ask them about, and, and ask them about their story. And if they tell you about a specific mine or a specific project, dig into the project. Find out, you know, what happened. It's not only about what you did right. You really, you only build things by figuring out what you did wrong. And so it's about not making those mistakes again. And if you can find out by mentoring and, and I would record the sessions or write down notes, and that's my suggestion: is to do is to and you know to to go to those to find those universities I talked about that have those courses. The other thing I would suggest to young mining professionals is is to go to the investment conferences, the mining investment conferences. You can you can learn more about about uh, companies, and you can make more connections. 
um, uh, in the, at those, those, um, those mining conferences, um, be they investment conferences or technical conferences. Uh, and, you know, you can see personalities, you can look at different, different projects. Uh, I would encourage them to do that. Now, I know it's, it's COVID-19, so it's hard to do so, but I'm finding um, that there's virtual uh, conferences that are giving information on ESG, on tailings, um, tailings dam construction, uh, and I'm, I'm participating in a lot of these. So um, that's what I would encourage them to do. Great. And just Gordon, uh, as a last question, just to wrap it up, I want to ask you, uh, what advice would you give to investors out there and including our millennial members that are watching? Yeah. Um, one of the things I like to harp about is um, on the investment side is um, at $19 silver, um, a lot of companies and $19 going to 20 as I've, 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 prof I've prophesied, um, a lot of companies will do well even if they have poor assets. But don't look for the companies that do well when, mining, when, uh, when the commodity prices rises. Invest in companies that have good assets when the, even when the price of the commodity is, uh, goes lower. And those kind of companies, those kind of assets are assets that are usually high grade and have, have got good scale and they've got, and they've got long lives to them, long, long mine lives. So look for companies that have good grade, long mine, mine, long mine life and good management. Management with experience, management that have taken companies before and made money for investors. So it's good assets that are large, good grade, because they can withstand the vagaries of commodity price swings. If you're going to invest, look, in company, look at companies that will make money on the downside, not only on the upside, and look for management that will um, uh, look for management that has experience. It's assets and management that make companies. And the other piece of advice that I would just give them is they're, you know, the young mining professionals, uh, they're the ones that are going to take over the reins. Um, they, they, you know, their vision of what this world should look like. Is, is, a, is, a, is a correct one, one where, you know, we, we don't rape and pillage the planet, we do it the right way. Um, we take the technologies that we're, that we're putting together to make um, ex uh, mineral extraction safe and environmentally safe and personally safe and put those to work. Take those visions and views that they hold dear and, and make them work and then and, and they'll turn out fine. That's great advice. Well, th thank you so much, Gordon, for, for the discussion today. I mean, it was very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, uh, as I said, it's very important to make sure that the, the, the torch is passed to the right way to the people who are going to be working in this business. So thank you for having me. Thank you and stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.